Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York City. I'm Matt Miller. And I'm Kaylee Lines. Welcome to Bloomberg Crypto, a look at the people, transactions, and technology shaping the world of decentralized finance. Coming up, grossly inexperienced and unsophisticated. That's how FTX CEO John J. Ray describes Sam Bankman Freed, adding that there is no separation between the exchange and Alameda. Meanwhile, the DOJ charges Bankman Freed with eight criminal counts, including conspiracy, wire fraud, and campaign finance violations. We'll have the latest after his arrest in the Bahamas. And regulators are alleging fraud as well. More on the civil cases filed by both the SEC and the CFTC today. All right, so all of that is ahead. Clearly a massive day for FTX, Sam Bankman Fried, and crypto, but it also is a big macro day considering we got cooler than expected November CPI data out earlier this morning. What is interesting is that influence on the equity market seems to be waning as the day grows older. The Nasdaq 100 at one point was up 3.9%. It is now up by only about half of 1%, though the move is holding more firmly in the bond market with the two-year yield down more than 16 basis points to right around 421. And the move is holding in crypto as well. Bitcoin still higher by 2.6% on the day. It got very, very close to 18,000 earlier, right now trading at $17,630 or so. But note the break between uh, digital assets themselves, those cryptocurrencies moving higher on the day, and an exchange, Coinbase, down about 6.3%. There is a lot of concern around exchanges and people perhaps wanting to pull their money out given uh, the allegations of what happened at FTX. And we know Binance has been dealing uh, with issues surrounding that, Matt. They've seen billions of dollars yep. pulled out in the last week. Well, and massive compliance costs are a coming. Let's get more of the collapse of FTX and the aftermath. Team coverage for you from Bloomberg. Shanali Basic is on Capitol Hill and Laura Davison and Ben Boehner joining us from Washington, D.C. as well. Let's start with what we heard from John J. Ray. Here's what he had to say before the House Financial Services Committee today. The FTX group's collapse appears to stem from absolute concentration of control in the hands of a small group of grossly inexperienced and unsophisticated individuals who failed to implement virtually any of the systems or controls that are necessary for a company entrusted with other people's money or assets. Let's kick it off with Shanali Basic, our global finance correspondent. So, um, Shanali, you're there on Capitol Hill. Uh, tell us how it's going. Extraordinary amount of detail being announced today, both between the indictment that we saw and sealed earlier today, as well as the SEC complaint, and as well as the testimony you're hearing of FTX CEO John Ray. Among the things he's saying is uh, really disputing some of the things that Sam Bankman Freed has been saying. One of those things being that it would be very speculative to say that FTX U.S. customers would get their assets back on a one to one basis here. He also says something that disputes what a lot of people in the crypto industry would say is that uh, he doesn't think that this would have mattered where the company was located. There was such uh, little oversight of this company to begin with. Again, as we dispute what uh, the proper oversight would be in the United States, of course, that's a really big statement to hear from him as well. But he does say, of course, oversight is needed. Again, that's part of the reason that these hearings happen, both to protect customers that have lost money mm -hmm. in this debacle. But remember, we've been talking about it on the show over and over and over. There are a handful, a half a dozen or so bankruptcies already underway. So more customer money to be lost in this industry, fraud or no fraud. Well, Shanali, on the topic of oversight, what did you also make of the language some of the lawmakers were using around regulation and the roles of the C SEC and CFTC here? I think it's really interesting, and we're going to get that uh, get into that with a lawmaker very soon as well, because there is a dispute here about how the SEC handles uh, the crypto industry, regulation by enforcement here. But remember, from the SEC's point of view as well, they've already gone after uh, the idea of certain tokens already. FTT is the poster child here of tokens uh, uh, being securities or not securities and how something can go wrong in this way. But remember, that's not even what was up for dispute here. What really today the SEC's complaints surrounded around was the idea that as Sam Bankman fried had misled investors and uh, that he, the commingling of funds that existed between Alameda and FTX. But that broader issue at play here is the FTT token as well. And you're starting to hear lawmakers currently talk to uh, John Ray about that and whether FTX would have even been solvent had Binance not even sold some of their tokens, and he said it wouldn't have been anyways. 
All right, Bloomberg Shanali Bostic reporting from Capitol Hill. Thank you so much. Meanwhile, in the Bahamas, Sam Bankman Fried has appeared in court for arraignment proceedings after his arrest late yesterday. He said he won't waive his right to an extradition hearing. The indictment, of course, unsealed by the Southern District Court of New York today, charging him with eight criminal counts, including conspiracy and wire fraud. Bloomberg's Laura Davidson is joining us now from Washington with more. So, Laura, tell us more about the details of these allegations. Yeah, so there's eight different criminal accounts as well as several other civil accounts here. This is really an incredible uh, cooperation between uh, uh, different government agencies as well as between the U.S. government and the Bahamian government that have been cooperating across the board. You know, uh, Sam Bankman Fried is entitled to an extradition trial, uh, but what we've seen is, is really just um, both governments in lockstep here uh, to try to pursue this case. Uh, the other thing that, that is really clear and kind of the, you seeing the dots being connected on Capitol Hill here as well as spelled out in these charges is that money went into FT. Alameda, and there was just no controls in between. So money came in, people thought they were depositing money into their accounts, and that ended up somewhere else, perhaps in a loan to um, SBF or one of the other top executives, um, or perhaps uh, one of the charges uh, alleges that they were campaign donations that went to politicians. Yeah, campaign donations in the tens of millions of dollars, right? Sam Bankman Fried gave Democrats 45 million, his lieutenants gave Republicans a lot of money. What do we know about? Um, the recipients of that money and if they're going to be able to give it back. Yeah, so, um, you know, if they are found guilty of these charges, it means that, you know, all the money that um, SBF, as well as other top executives have given, Ryan Salem, who don donated mostly to uh, Republicans, all the way back to 2019 and 2020. In total, that's about $84 million that's out there that was uh, could potentially be clawed back. Um, you know, this is a very long and arduous process, but this will really entangle FTX, as well as, you know, a broad swath of politicians on Capitol Hill that are going to get tied up in this that may have to pay back money. All right, Laura, thanks very much. Laura Davis, and they're doing the reporting on the ground in terms of what's going on uh, with the money that SBF and his cronies gave to politicians in Washington. Now, regulators have also come out with criminal charges against Bankman Freed. The SEC accused him of defrauding investors out of $1.8 billion this morning, and the CFTC is suing Bankman Freed, FTX, and Alameda Research for violations of federal commodities. Commodities laws. CFTC Commissioner Kristen Johnson joined Bloomberg earlier. These pools of customer funds were treated like stashes of cash and used to do all kinds of inappropriate things, including uh, leverage plays to acquire competitors, uh, acquisitions of lavish beachfront homes. Uh, this is the antithesis of anything that is permitted in regulated markets. We will, uh, to the fullest extent of our remit, uh, plan to enforce the law. All right, Ben Bain joins us now from Washington as well. Uh, I'm not sure if I said regulators filed criminal charges. They can't do that. They filed civil charges. Still very serious. What do we know about um, uh, 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 the lawsuits, Ben? Yeah, uh, that, that's right. Uh, very serious. And in line with what criminal authorities did unseal today um, in Manhattan, uh, basically regulators uh, laid out a pretty uh, tough case right now. If you just read what they're saying, what they're alleging happened, um, you know, it, it is it is pretty remarkable uh, the extent of the allegations that they're saying. They, they talk about the way he essentially was using stashes of money to fund a lavish lifestyle. Um, you know, this is kind of uh, really a remarkable fall from grace that we're kind of seeing a capstone on today, which is certainly still likely to, you know, continue to spool out. I mean, it's worth recalling just a little more than a month ago, Sam Bankman Fried was really the darling of the crypto mm -hmm. industry, and many was at the vanguard of finance. Um, FTX was on the uniforms of umpires in Major League Baseball. And today you have, as you're showing on the screen, um, you know, SEC Chair Gary Gensler basically uh, describing a house of cards, as he said, um, which was yeah. a foundation of deception. It's really, really pretty remarkable. And yet, Ben, you had, and this was pointed out by Representative Tom Emmer, who's a re Republican from Minnesota during the hearings today, that Gary Gensler has met with Sam Bankman Fried, that he, and this is the quote from the hearing, met with FTX more than anyone else in the industry. How is the SEC going to reconcile this when they are talking about fraud that they say has been happening over the course of years at the same time when they have also been in conversations with FTX for years? Definitely, there's a lot of tough questions that Gary Gensler and other regulators are going to have to answer to that point, particularly as Republicans take over uh, the House of Representatives here in Washington next month. Uh, this is already a political issue. Um, 
the, the idea, though, of um, Sam Bankman Fried and FTX having a footprint uh, exclusively at the SEC um, just isn't just isn't correct, though. I mean, it mm-hmm. was they were meeting um, frequently with regulators, the CFTC. And as um, Laura was discussing earlier, uh, there were extensive political donations to both parties coming from executives at FTX and from political uh, campaign uh, donations really coming from, uh, you know, various organizations associated with FTX. So um, FTX and Sam Bankman fried did quite a job charming Washington. Um, and certainly uh, the SEC did have meetings with them, but I don't think it was just the SEC that was perhaps giving them an ear. Ben, thanks very much. Ben Bain, they're reporting from Washington, D.C. on uh, issues surrounding the regulators as well. Coming up, Danelle Dixon, crypto regulation advocate and head of nonprofit blockchain organization Stellar Development Foundation, sits down with us um, to talk about what she thinks needs to be done in the future. And we'll also get the take live from Capitol Hill with Republican Representative Frank Lucas of Oklahoma. Plus, to access all the latest data and news on crypto, check out CRYP Go on the terminal. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Crypto. I'm Kaylee Lines with Matt Miller. Well, let's get back to Capitol Hill, where Bloomberg Shanali Bostic is joined by Republican Representative Frank Lucas of Oklahoma. Shanali, over to you. Kaylee, thank you so much for your time. And Representative, thank you for joining me. Something I wonder about is when you listen to the hearing testimony of John Ray, the new CEO of FTX, are you finding that you can find any closure for your constituents or any path forward? I wish I could say that, but clearly this is a multi-billion dollar mess that's going to continue. When Mr. Ray pointed out to us that the bookkeeping system was rudimentary, off-the-shelf small business software being used to manage a multi-billion dollar enterprise, when he discussed the lack of strong board management in the various enterprises, the ability of the CEO to loan himself money out of the company, uh, it was horrifying. But that's what this hearing is about. Get to the to the bottom of the mess so we can figure out how to make sure from Congress's perspective, this doesn't happen again. Has it changed your view of the entire crypto industry, or do you view this as a one-off event? Well, I've always been a little suspicious of crypto, not so much from the perspective of the professional investors, but there are a lot of little people out there who put their money into this who've been pulled in. I said in 32 of my town meetings this summer, only invest the money you don't need. It's the Wild West right now in crypto. Unfortunately, there was a gunfight, and the investors may have lost. You asked during the hearing also why certain assets were left out of the bankruptcy. Do you feel that those assets should have been included? Well, ultimately, the investors will want as much of their money back as they can possibly get. And when Mr. Ray could identify a billion dollars that they had pretty well tied down, but if public reports are to be believed, that means six or seven billion may not uh, be accounted for yet. I'm very unnerved. And I also wanted to know, because the international nature hundred and some enterprises scattered around the world in FTX, how, uh, how that uh, would act. Would, would prudent regulators, perhaps in the United States and other countries, have assets and countries where perhaps the regulation wasn't so prudent, will they want to draw upon that? Those are all questions that ultimately will be answered, but it's important to people who put some, maybe their life savings, I hope not, but put real money into this, what now appears to have been a fraud. Among your peers on this committee, there seems to be a debate here about the role of the SEC when it comes to enforcement of the crypto industry and laying out the rules of the land here. What do you feel is the right role for the SEC versus the CFTC, as you've also previously spent time on the Agriculture Committee? I chaired the Ag Committee when we had Mr. former uh, Senator Corzine under oath about his debacle. CFTC is a proactive entity. You come to them with ideas and concepts. They proactively make rules and regulations. Securities Exchange Commission is a reactive group. They come in after the fact. It's two different cultures, two different perspectives. We'll see when all this sorts out. Incoming chairman of the Financial Services Committee, Patrick McHenry, is very focused on bringing order to the crypto industry. Uh, We'll see what form that takes. But it will involve both ag and financial services, and we've got to make sure that this kind of a mess can't happen again. Do you have faith 
faith that some of these rules can be sorted out in near term when even committee members are disputing on the role of the SEC? Well, you saw the fundamental disagreement. Part of my colleagues in the committee believe that crypto should not exist and essentially should be banned. Part of my colleagues on the committee believe it is the future of commerce, uh, the standard of, of currency. I'm not sure where we fall yet in that process, but crypto is not going away. But it's taken a big old hit thanks to uh, the folks at FT FTX. You and some of your peers have also told me they remember Sam Bankman-Fried walking through these halls fairly often. You were in a hearing with him very recently as well. Some of the committee members had also taken political donations from Sam Bankman-Fried. Well, at the time, those contributions would have been given, and I don't believe I received any of those. He was the wonder boy of crypto. He was the wonder boy of modern finance. He told everyone he'd created a system that could not fail, that would only work. Well, like uh, most uh, wonder boys... He's under arrest now. So what do you think that those committee members should do with the funds? I can't answer that question. If it was given in good faith, that's the decision they have to make. But it is also why we all have to be prudent as public officials about the help we receive. Representative, thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. Kaylee Matt, back to you. All right, Bloomberg's Shanali Bostic with Republican Representative Frank Lucas. Thank you both so much. Now let's head from Capitol Hill over to the Bahamas. Sam Bankman-Fried has appeared in court for arraignment proceedings after his arrest late yesterday. Katanga Johnson, our banking regulation reporter, was in the room. He joins us now from Nassau. Katanga, what did we learn from those proceedings? Much of what we saw today uh, during the initial part of the arraignment was the lawyers for both the U.S. government and those for Sam Bankman fried discuss whether um, at this juncture he would be a flight risk. There was much debate, fireworks even, around whether it was appropriate to uh, have him be considered for bail. Lawyers on both sides presented their case. Bankman fried himself testified to say that he, um, in just in his own view, uh, would relinquish his right to an extradition. We're still waiting to learn more about what this might mean. Will he fight an extradition to the U.S. or otherwise is yet to be determined. Uh, the court is now adjourned for an hour, and we'll, we'll continue to hear more from that. All right, Katanga, you'll continue to report then um, for us from the Bahamas. Katanga Johnson there talking to us in, um, a, in a recess of the Sam Bankman Freed arraignment hearing. Joining us now to talk about regulation is Danelle Dixon, CEO and executive director of Stellar Development Foundation. It's a nonprofit organization building the internet for payments using blockchain technology. Danelle has been a prominent advocate for a more green, a more transparent, and a safer crypto market. She's previously testified on the Hill at the same time as Sam Bankman-Fried. Also joining us out of Washington, D.C. is Nathan Dean, Bloomberg Intelligence Senior U.S. Policy Analyst. And now let me start with you and ask um, what you think this situation means we need. Is it more regulation? Because a lot of this happened at what would appear to be outside of the SEC jurisdiction. And a lot of the crimes that have um, been com been committed, at least what looks like um, those crimes, uh, 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 how, how John J. Ray described them, um, are already illegal. Yeah, I think so much of what you just said is spot on. The truth of the matter is, like, what happened here and what, what uh, Mr. Ray focused on was the fact that there was just a violation of all of those tried and true corporate formalities and those necessary controls that we have and that we need to have. We didn't even have a full board over the whole FTX group. There are so many challenges with what happened here. I have talked to, um, you know, I've seen high school bake sales that have been so much more uh, strong strength in terms of what they put together and how they've managed the assets. We can't have that in a company of this size and this scale. This has nothing to do with crypto and blockchain. And frankly, you see a lot of that discussion happening today. We saw even Chairwoman Waters recognized that the distinction between a lot of what happened here was not about the technology. Congressman McHenry, Congressman Emmer, Congressman Gottheimer, they really focused on the distinction between don't throw this technology out just because we have this one really bad actor and we have just a total disregard of corporate controls and formalities. So this is what I see. Do we need more regulation? The fact is we do have some gaps and we've been advocating for regulation. We'd love to see the CFTC step up and take a, a stronger role. We supported the legislation that was put together on the Senate side on that. 
We would also love to see a clear distinction between what is a security, therefore what falls under the SEC's jurisdiction, and what is a commodity. We don't have yeah. clear rules of the road here, and we need that. Well, and many have been calling upon Congress to designate what the rule, rules of the road are. So, Nathan, to bring you in here, what was your take on the tone out of this hearing today, and how does it perhaps influence your thinking about the likelihood of Congress getting through com some kind of comprehensive regulatory framework in the next year? Yeah, so, you know, going into the hearing, my, my biggest question was, are we going to see more Democratic lawmakers join the likes of Representative Brad Sherman and essentially saying, let crypto implode? And we only saw a little bit of that, not enough for me to really change my thinking on, will Congress try to attempt legislation next year? The problem is the Democrats want to do something, the Republicans want to do something, but that something is different. So, you know, I, I think there are provisions that can come about next year. I don't think there's going to be a, a quick result of this, but, you know, to, to the prior points, you know, I, I think Congress will come in and say, look, we need to defer, determine what is a security versus what is a commodity. We need to ensure that uh, uh, exchanges and platforms have a way to register either with the CFTC or the SEC. The SEC will most likely retain control of 99% of the tokens out there, and there needs to be additional custody and segregation of assets. That was the one thing that John Ray said multiple times when policymakers asked them to opine on regulatory matters is segregation of assets. Now, that regulation really already exists, whether it's SEC or CFTC, but they just have to spin it for crypto. Right, and it wouldn't have mattered anyway for the assets, for the lion's share of FTX.com's assets were... Um, were deposited for non-U.S. customers. I want to ask about, um, Nathan, uh, about Coinbase. We saw those shares fall today, not specifically about the company, but I instantly thought of your note on compliance costs. Do you think we got any indication today um, for those existing U.S. entities that are regulated here how much their compliance costs are going to go up? So, you know, it, we, we're, we're estimating right now in the tens of millions of dollars. And it, it, it's hard because obviously, you know, it, it, for example, if you want to go have a conversation, just a conversation with the SEC, you're looking at least 100000 to 250000 with your legal costs for ex external counsel and so forth like that. But for the more established companies, we think this is more of a manageable issue, not a material issue. So if you're talking about Coinbase or even Benayance, if they want to have a conversation with the SEC, this is, this is manageable. The problem is, is for the mom and pop startups out there. And this is what I think a lot of the legislation next year is going to do, is it's going to favor institutional. It's not going to favor decentralized you know, or mom and pop startups, Web3 developers, because from their point of view, Going to talk to the SEC and paying that $100,000 is not something that they want to do when they're in their early stages of a startup. Yeah, and, and to expand on that point, Danelle, obviously part of the criminal allegations are campaign finance violations, that he broke the law with some of these political donations that he made so many of during this midterms election cycle in 2022. How are you thinking about that and the influence in Washington and the trust, perhaps, that needs to be built back, considering this man in had an incredible amount of influence and a lot of people got burnt. Yeah, no, this has been a really big challenge. If you think about what happens in new new time, kind of technology, it happened in the early days of the web. You take like 20 steps forward with respect to policy and regulation when you meet with regulators and you engage and you share information. And then something like this happens and you take like 100 steps back. And this is just part of what we need to focus on as an industry to really pay attention to the needs of the regulatory bodies. I am a big believer in principles-based legislation. I'm a big believer in fighting for innovation and making sure that we don't exclude uh, those mom and pop Web3 developers uh, that, you, that you just mentioned, Nathan. I think it's really important that we actually advocate for that, that we pay attention to not uh, just, you know, make kings in this space. So this is what we're going to continue to fight for, and we're going to continue to engage. We are really excited to see the bipartisan work that's been going on here, and we hope to see it again uh, continue through the year. All right. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for. But, Danelle, please come back and talk more with us. Thank you so much to Danelle Dixon of the Stellar Development Foundation. And thanks as well to Nathan Dean of Bloomberg Intelligence. Matt, what a day. Yeah, an incredible day and uh, a lot of drama. Maybe not as much as we would have gotten had Sam Bankman free right. been allowed to testify. So there's still a lot of questions, I think, about the timing of the arrest and the fact that he couldn't speak in front of Congress publicly. But um, certainly there was a lot of theater with uh, Congress and John Ray. Yeah, and more theater coming up at 2 p.m. Eastern when the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York will be holding a news conference. So don't miss that later. And don't miss Bloomberg Crypto next week, Tuesday, 1 p.m. Eastern time right here on Bloomberg.